Welcome, everybody. Um, again, uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kate Morhini. I uh, use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the artistic producer at North Theatre in New York City, also a member of the MENA Theatre Makers Alliance, um, and I'm joining today from Lenape land on Manahata. Um, and I'm here today with a group of incredible actors whom you're about to meet in a moment to share excerpts of The Revolution's Promise, which is a collection of testimonies across the years detailing the risks and violent attacks Palestinian artists have faced and continue to face. The Revolution's Promise was created by the Freedom Theater, uh, which is uh, whom you've heard from earlier on in the in the broadcast, if you were with us earlier, um, and artists on the front line. The Freedom Theater is a theater and cultural center in, Jan in Janine refugee camp in occupied Palestine. The theater has created a generation of artists and leaders who one day will be at the forefront of the Palestinian liberation movement. This past February, they were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Artists on the Frontline is a creative space and platform for radical artists working on the front line of social and political change. Their work and the testimonies of the revolution's promise, which you're about to hear, are more relevant than ever as Palestinian artists are facing increased violence and censorship. The Freedom Theater has been attacked by the Israeli army and members of its staff have been forcefully detained, including producer Mustafa Shetta, who has been held by the Israeli army since December 13th, 2023, and continues to be held without charge or trial. As the systemic violation of Palestinians' rights continues, the testimonies shared in the revolution's promise feel more relevant than ever. I'm grateful today to be joined by this stellar group of performers who will voice the testimonies from the Freedom Theater. Um, I'd like to invite everybody now to come on camera and please take a moment to introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Rudy Rushdi. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, um, and I'm coming to you today from Jersey City, New Jersey, by way of Egypt, and I feel very honored to be here. Hi, Assalamu Alaikum. My name is Wasim Azir. I am a New York City based theater artist. I use he, him pronouns. I am Palestinian, raised in North Carolina, and I am very happy to be here. Hi, my name is Heather Raffo. She, her, hers. I come to you from Lanape land in Brooklyn. Hi there, I'm Victoria Nassif, she, her pronouns. I'm Palestinian and Lebanese. I'm an actor and intimacy director, and I'm really honored to be here today. Hi, my name is Hanine Arafat Murphy. I'm coming to you from New Jersey. I'm an actor, I use she, her pronouns, and I am Palestinian American. I'm Najla Saeed. I am a Palestinian Lebanese American actor and writer. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I'm honored to be here today as Juliana Omer Hamis was a dear friend of mine. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and just before we begin, a few quick uh, notes. Uh, each performer will be reading the name of the person whose words they're voicing. Um, a few notes from the script. The script is comprised of testimonies from Palestinian artists, as well as material available online. The interviews have been edited and juxtaposed together, and people were interviewed separately without knowing who else was being interviewed. Each interviewee's perspective, thoughts, and ideas are solely their own. Um, and one more note from me, towards the end uh, of the piece, you'll hear testimony from the Youth and Child Coordinator at the Freedom Theater. Uh, that testimony is more recent um, and speaks really directly uh, to the current situation on the ground. Um, Without further ado, excerpts from the revolution's promise. Dreams of liberation, historical Palestine. Muhammad Bakri, actor and director, director of Janine Janine. I grew up on values of liberation that we should all be revolutionaries. By the age of 15, I dreamed of going to Lebanon on foot to become a fighter, and that before I arrived, while I was in the wilderness, a tiger would attack me, and I would kill it and drag it behind me as I continued on my way. This tiger would be my ticket to join the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and I would be a hero. 
What do you want more than that? I have killed a tiger. And it really happened that I went to go to Lebanon intending to kill the tiger. But on my way to becoming a revolutionary, as night fell and darkness reigned, I felt fear, imagining where the monsters and hyenas lay. So I decided to go home. These were dreams, dreams of a child who wanted to be a revolutionary but did not have the courage to kill a tiger. So things remained just a dream. But I had an obsession. Perhaps this is why I went into cinema and theater, because there is the possibility of realizing dreams of liberation, not through armed struggle, but through culture. I was an actor performing on the stage in Nazareth when news began to spread about a massacre in Janine refugee camp. We could hear the bombing from the stage, so we decided to stop the play. I went with Valentina, uh, my colleague, to the demonstration. At the protest, an old Israeli in an army uniform with wild eyes took out an automatic weapon and started shooting at us. Valentina was hit by a bullet in her hand. It was the first time in my life that I was at a scene like this, that I saw this, this amount of blood. And I started to think, if these soldiers gave all this hatred while standing in peace, what would the Israeli army do in Jenin, where there is fierce resistance? I rented a jeep, a camera, and a sound device. I infiltrate through the mountains, a closed military zone. The Israeli army convoys passed, and we marched on until we reached Jenin. When I saw the situation there and how much Janine was destroyed, I was paralyzed. I did not know what to do. My body trembled. I managed to control my nerves and for five consecutive days filmed whatever my eyes fell on. Spontaneous act with my limited capabilities walking the streets and filming people that I encountered. Since the first screening of my documentary, Janine, Janine, there have been protests, revenge and intimidation, attempts to silence me, make me a lesson for those who think about undertaking actions critical of Israel. Trials and prosecutions have been going on for 20 years, from 2002 until now. I'm tired and tired, the same stories, the same accusations. In 2021, I was fined $55,000 for defamation damages to be paid to an Israeli army captain who participated in the invasion of Janine camp. Then the judge ordered that the documentary be permanently banned from being screened. Hmm. Today, I continue to tell my story because I do not see any other solution. And I do not see any other way to address my case except to deliver it to the world. My dream is to tell the great story of Palestine, about my life and our lives. But for now, I'll go smoke. Building a National Identity, Yabus Cultural Center, Jerusalem. Rania Elias, Director, Yabus Cultural Center. Who I am is not an easy answer, but put simply, I am a mother of four children and a dog. I'm 49 and I'm not afraid to announce this because getting old is great. Every experience is a learning opportunity. I love life. Everything I do is with love. I decided from the beginning to leave a trace wherever I work to commit with full passion. The Oslo Agreement indicated Jerusalem's fate and that the Israelis had plans to occupy the city entirely. So we formed Yabus Cultural Center in 1995 to strengthen artistic life in Jerusalem. It was the start of a challenge, an impossible task to keep Jerusalem, our Palestinian capital, on the map. We were broke. 
building something from nothing but our effort and our ideas. Over 25 years, we created a strong cultural foundation with thousands of activities, and Yabus became one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. However, the challenges have become bigger and bigger. There are difficulties with the Israeli authorities who oversee our premises and must grant a work permit. Many donors do not like our vision, so we must reject funding to remain true to our values and national identity. We are prohibited from working with many Palestinians who have specialist skills. As after the wall was built, they could not travel to Jerusalem. I am from Bethlehem, living in Jerusalem on a family unification permit, so my personal situation is unstable. There have been many threats by Israeli authorities to take it away if I do not stop working at Yabus. The center has been closed down several times. The Israelis were so determined to cancel one festival that they arrested the organizers and then started chasing a balloon with the festival logo down the street. Recently, there was the relocation of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and with it plans to abolish any institution working to uphold Palestinian national culture. This was when attacks on us intensified, starting with the arrest of my husband and me. It's nine o'clock in the morning when the Israeli army arrived at our house. I woke my children and I told them to not be afraid. They search our house, taking research papers, education certificates, our photos and passports. They stormed Yabu Center, confiscating everything and loading it into cars. My interrogation lasted 12 hours. And when I was released on bail, I was banned from speaking to anyone from Yabuz for a month, including my husband. Since then, the Israeli authorities have not stopped calling and questioning me. We are still trying to recover the confiscated computers, documents, and files, and I have had further interrogations and bans from contacting anyone at Yabuz Center. There's no official crime to charge us with, so they work in a roundabout way through intimidation obstructing our path and an attempt to break our morale. So yes, the challenges in Jerusalem are huge. And for sure, they cannot stand a strong Palestinian woman who leads an institution that strives, who can speak to the media and has relations with thousands of people around the world. A Palestinian woman who defies the stereotype they wish to paint and who works to plant the seeds of belonging love for Jerusalem and for Palestine. To be or not to be, Ida Refugee Camp, Bethlehem. Muhammad al artist and photographer, Lechi Cultural Center. I started photography as an artist, taking photos in the camp, just daily life, the people, the children, the houses, but the moment you live in Palestine, it becomes difficult to photograph anything unrelated to the Israeli military occupation. The situation forces you to cover it again and again. I was in my office when the shooting started. So as I usually do, I took my camera and I stood by the window to take photos. Around 10 Israeli soldiers marched through the camp, firing bullets, tear gas, and sound bombs indiscriminately. I continued taking photos and the soldiers continued to approach. They got to the office where I was leaning out of the window and they started shouting, go to your house now. They were exceptionally violent at the time. So I started to close my window. At that moment, one of the soldiers directed his rifle toward my face and shot me. The bullet hit me in my face. They shot with the intent to kill. If I had not been on the second floor, I would be dead. I was screaming while I heard them laughing loudly. I started to bleed very hard. I, I thought that I was going to die. But I was more worried about the camera than myself because it contained photos of the soldier who shot me. I was hospitalized for 17 days. My eyes were pulled out of their place. They put platinum pieces to fix the bone. They performed three surgeries. I couldn't eat because I couldn't move my mouth and I drank processed food with a straw. 
After I got released from the hospital, I stayed with my sister. That night, about 40 soldiers broke down the door, storming my parents' home, destroying everything in their way. They gave them a summons notice demanding I go to interrogation. I needed to see a doctor for medical follow-ups on my surgery and regularly take medicine. If I surrender myself, this wouldn't be possible. For two months, I secretly moved between several houses in Bethlehem as the army continued to assault my family. When the condition in my face improved, I went home. That night, they came and broke in. I ran and escaped, so they attacked my family, even my grandfather and grandmother. It was a long night. Eventually, they found me and began a violent attack. I begged them not to hit my face, but the moment I asked, they directed their blows there. They put me in a military base under investigation for 12 days. <laughs> they found no evidence for their allegations. I was transferred between five courts, none of them able to substantiate the charges against me. Finally, the judge decided to release me, fining me $500 and telling me I had to come to court every month for an interview. This continued for three years. I went back to the field in photography. I decided not to be stationed at the, the office window anymore. I decided to approach the soldiers to photograph between them. After they shot me in the face, what's the worst they can do? They wanted to kill me, to stop me from taking pictures and filming, but it is a challenge that keeps me going. They pushed me towards the idea of to be or not to be. The story of the Janine Freedom Theater, Janine Refugee Camp 2006 to 2011. Mariam Abu Khalid, acting student, the Freedom Theater. I was 18 years old and studying in the school for girls. I wasn't very good and I wasn't really interested. A friend's sister told me about the theater, so I decided to see what was going on. The first person I saw was Giuliano. Giuliano Mir Khamis, co-founder and artistic director of the Freedom Theater. Are you here because you want to be an actress? And I thought, Wait a minute, I, I don't know what I want to be. Giuliano invited me to see the stage, and I was really surprised. If you want, we have a role for you. And I thought, what is role? You just have to come and do rehearsals. I thought, wow, fuck, okay. I joined the first ever class of professional acting students. I was really happy to go every day and rehearse with Giuliano. Then suddenly there was a costume, and I was like, why did he give me a black dress and everyone else is in white. And he starts to explain to me the idea of the play. Maybe it's the political groups against each other. Uh, maybe it's the angel and the devil. Maybe it's the women's power against the man's power. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? It was tough. Crazy, because I didn't understand shit. What it is to stand on stage and be proud and open. I believed that women had to take care how we walk and talk, how we sit. Once, Giuliano sent me back home because all I was doing was pulling my t-shirt down, afraid that someone was watching my ass. There were things in my head that were hard to get rid of. Israel is pushing the Palestinian people into the Stone Age, destroying the cultural identity. Our responsibility as artists is to rebuild or reconstruct this destruction who we are, why we are, where we are going, who we want to be. You have to forget all these oppressive ideas and be you. Discover your voice, your body, and your freedom. We are saying that freedom of expression comes first, before freedom from the occupation. With Giuliano, the revolutionary values were clear from the beginning, that we can't be on stage without understanding why. Ahmed Tobasi, current artistic director, the Freedom Theater. My group was called the Bad Boys. Yes, because for sure we were bad boys. Spending our time on the street, smoking, not in school, maybe even stealing things to sell so that we can eat. 
And Giuliano liked that. It excited him. He could see our fucked up potential. The Bad Boys created the first ever show at the Freedom Theater. The journey was about the kids in the camp who wanted to go to the sea, a dream of every Palestinian child. My first acting production was called Fragments. We had the premiere, which I did not understand at all. And suddenly there was an audience and lights. The play talked about young people's lives. So when they saw the play, the theater became a part of them. And there was screaming and clapping. What the fuck? It was very nice to be seen, to be heard, to share an understanding. We became a bit famous in the camp. And I still hadn't told my family that I'm doing theater. One week later, it was the results for the final exams in school and I failed. I told Giuliano, and he was really happy and laughing. Bravo. Good. I didn't know what was my mission in life, but then I understood that the Freedom Theater was the place to be. The theater showed me that there's a whole world out there I never knew existed. And for the first time in my life, I was given a decision. And the choice I wanted to make had become so clear. I wanted to choose to be alive. And now, I had a mission to tell my story. Prisons within prisons, various military jails, Israel. Suhail Khouri, musician and composer, general director of National Conservatory of Music. I'm a musician, a composer, a teacher, and a dancer. The murder of my mother's cousin, Kamal Nasser, a leader, writer, and poet, greatly impacted me. I was 10 years old, and I began to comprehend what was going on in a deeper way. At the beginning of the first intifada, the Israelis did not pay any attention to revolutionary music. But then, just as they decided to smash the hands of the children who threw stones, they banned these songs in all their forms. One day, I was on my way back from the copy studio, and I secretly had in my possession about 6,000 tapes. The soldiers had been watching me for a long time, and the army set up a special ambush on the road. An ambush like this was normally only intended to capture a revolutionary leader. They arrested me as if I was a terrorist, and what I had was a weapon. Doreen Tartour, poet, writer, and photographer. In 2015, I witnessed the killing of dozens of Palestinian youths who were murdered in cold blood I watched how they killed a woman at the checkpoint because she refused to take off her hijab. There was the kidnapping and murder of a 16-year-old boy by Israeli settlers and the firebombing of a home that severely burnt a baby and killed his parents. I was feeling suffocated, unable to express the ugliness of these crimes. I felt guilty as a human being and it was breaking my soul. How are these children killed in front of our eyes while we are just watching? It is a stain on our forehead. So I wrote a poem calling for my people to resist this crazy violence. It was the cry of pain I was feeling. I posted the poem on Facebook. It was three in the morning and I was asleep. Suddenly I hear the scream of my family saying, Darin, the Israelis are coming to arrest you. Lo'ai Tafash, dancer and choreographer, founder Naqsh Popular Art Troupe. I'm from a poor neighborhood and my family life has always been overshadowed by occupation. My first arrest was was as an 18 year old student studying accounting at the university. I was sentenced to three years because of my union work. Nine years later, my life contained nothing more than a plan to marry my fiance and working with my dance group. Then I was arrested again. There was military, police, special forces, They started by blowing off my front door and storming my house. More than 40 soldiers in my home and five armored vehicles closing the entrances. Only the soldiers' eyes were visible. It is a special squad called the Mass Division and they are shouting. They want to intimidate. As they put on the handcuffs, I asked to see an arrest warrant, but they did not give me anything. I was arrested and I'm trying to understand what's happening. Is this a nightmare or reality? They transferred me between several prisons for interrogation. My family did not know where I was. 
I was washing and wearing the same wet clothes I was arrested in. When I tried to find out the reason for my arrest, they answered that they cannot give me this information because we have to keep the source confidential. They said they have secret materials about me. I was put in administrative detention. It is a preventative arrest based on the idea that you might do something that we do not want you to do. An arrest without any charges. The judge repeatedly postponed my trial. Then they searched my Facebook account. And after approximately 21 days, they presented my poem, Resist My People Resist Them. Through the poem, they accused me of planning to carry out a suicide operation and that I support terrorist entities. After nearly three weeks of interrogation, the intelligence officer asks, what is your dance troupe? Teach children. Answer, folk dance. Then in a provocative attempt to prove his theory, the officer turns the computer screen in my direction and shows me two videos of my dance group. I mean, what else besides folk dance are you planting in their minds? I insist it's a group of children age six to 16 learning folk dance. The officer began formulating his idea that everything I do in culture reflects my affiliation with a certain Palestinian political party that is hostile to Israel. I told him, this is not true. We're not aligned with a political party. Rather, we reject the presence of Israeli occupation, and we express this through our dances. The Israelis have always targeted the Palestinian cultural and intellectual front. Before them, the British mandate had the same tendency, imprisoning revolutionary poet Noah Ibrahim and confiscating his books until in the end, they assassinated him. So if my dance group is able to provoke the occupation with these two dances, then this is evidence that we're moving in the right direction. Ahmed Sabahani, cartoonist. I am a Palestinian born in Kuwait. Naji Al Ali used to work in Kuwaiti newspapers and was famous for his drawings about Palestine. When Naji Al Ali was killed for his work, my mother began to talk to us about our homeland through his cartoons. I became a cartoonist because I like cartoons. There's something easy to understand and creative in shaping your messages. I was placed in prison for two months alone inside small cells with rough walls without windows, just thinking about what is going to happen to me. How long will I stay? Starving for my family and friends, thinking about my work. Inside this definitely silent place, moments of weakness come. There's a struggle between wanting salvation at any cost and respecting yourself and your cause. You're left to question which of these two warring beasts you decide to feed. It is a method of torture. During the investigation, I was subjected to very severe psychological and physical torture. They were asking who wrote the songs, who composed them, who distributes them, and who produces them. They used a technique called the blender. The interrogator was big and strong, holding me firmly by the shoulders and shaking me with force for a very long time. I began to feel every organ inside my body vibrating and, and mixing like I was dying. They are trying to permanently stop us from functioning, from being able to practice normal behavior. They used a method known as the stretch. I was put on a chair without a back. My legs extended. One interrogator had his foot on my genitals and another foot pressing in my chest. I experienced severe pain. The end justifies the means. And they were ready to lie and fabricate any story. They told me that my house had been demolished while my family was in it. They said my mother had been killed, showing me distorted pictures of her home and bodies covered in blood, saying, you have nothing left to lose. Why resist confession? I decided that I am not a prisoner. I said to myself, I am a journalist who came here to do an artwork about the Palestinian prisoner to know about their experience. I got some pens, pencils, and paper and started creating artwork. I have a swift hand like a monkey. This is how I was drawing in prison. During the torture, certain musical melodies occurred to me and I would write them in my mind. By the 12th day, the torture reached such an extreme degree of violence that I turned numb. The investigation became useless, so they stopped it. At that moment, I felt two contradictory feelings. Firstly, I was on the verge of death because of the violence. 
and secondly, the opposite. As I learned that I had finally tri triumphed over the in interrogators, thus the musical melody I created was a victory piece with a contradiction. I did not just draw prisoners, but also their families outside who are in the big prison of Palestine. We had a library. I read history, politics, philosophy, and literature. I tried to transform my prison experience from a tool of oppression into an opportunity to arm myself with awareness. I decided I would make an exhibition, planning who exactly I am inviting, where I am going to hold it, and its main topics. I smuggled all the artwork out with one of the prisoners who was released. And when I got out, I held my exhibition. After five months in prison, they sent me to house arrest. Notice the contradiction. They claimed that I intended to kill Israelis and carry out terrorist operations. And at the same time, they put me in a house in an Israeli settlement. All they wanted from the beginning was for me to break and apologize. And this is what I did not give them. Apologize for what? I was there for just over five months. They claimed that I was connecting with an enemy of Israel. It's all stupid, unreasonable. They did not find a law to convict me, so they used a law from the days of the British mandate. They issued a verdict of 15 months under the title of incitement to violence and revolution. After a year, I got out, but the prison remained inside me, creating psychological damage in many places. It was not until 10 years later that I could write the music that had come to me whilst being tortured in prison. A person needs a lot of strength to be able to heal. Prison stays with me. And now I feel that I am in a bigger prison. I have a suspended sentence. So if I do anything that they find unacceptable, I'll be arrested again. They've denied me travel for three years. If you have a fear of being arrested or whatever they may do to you, this means you won't do anything. They achieve stopping your life. After two years, six months, and 18 days, I was released from house arrest. The settlers tried to kill me three times. I received many threatening and racist messages. I felt constantly in danger. I couldn't work, study, or publish my books. If I published or performed my poem, I would return to prison. I tried to open new doors, but I couldn't. Finally, I left for Sweden on a grant for artists under threat. Here I continue my fight. A moment and nine missiles. El Michel Cont Cultural Center, Gaza. Ali Abu Yassin, actor, writer, and director. Co-founder, El Michel Cultural Center. That day, we were supposed to show a play at El Michel Cultural Center in Gaza. The performance included 14 girls. It was about their rights. Suddenly, the United Nations Development Program called and ordered us to cancel without giving any reasons. We stopped the rehearsals and sent everyone home. It was the first time I had ever postponed a performance. I went home. And the Israelis began to bomb Gaza, and the rockets started shaking the city. The bombs were landing near the theater. I was afraid the cultural center would be damaged, that the glass would shatter, that the play's set would fall. I got dressed, I went out, I walked a street the length of 200 meters. It was completely black from smoke and dust, as if it was night. You could not even see your finger. As I approached, my vision started to become clear. The theater was destroyed. Complete destruction, nothing. The features of the place disappeared. The, the cultural center had vanished from existence and become a whole. A six-story building now turned into a two-story underground crater. How could this be? The set from the plays, the, the costumes that I designed, my hopes and dreams, the effort and exhaustion collapsing in a second? I'm standing there and thoughts are clashing in my head like waves. Sadness eating my heart as if when the decor disappeared, so had all the joy. 
The faces of the youth I trained passed in front of me, the children's laughter that had now vanished. Until this moment, I cannot believe that the theater disappeared along with 14 years of our work in a moment and nine missiles. Our theater had become a theatrical flame, so they shut it down. Since the bombing, we have held several performances on the rubble. The theater is a part of us. And we as artists continue, whether it is in a building or not. We will do theater on the tree, at sea, underwater. We have created artists, and we will stay to be artists. A diversity of tactics. Boycott divestment sanctions worldwide. Omar Barghouti, co-founder, Boycott Divestment Sanctions, BDS. I am an engineer by profession and an artist by passion and a student of philosophy. I was born in exile, a son of refugees. I came back to Palestine in 1993 with my partner, who is a Palestinian citizen in the state of Israel. I think every part of my experience has helped me in my work as a human rights defender. I was part of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. That was my first formative experience in that type of global struggle. And I learned a lot. The Boycott Divestment Sanctions of Israel, BDS, was launched by the largest coalition in Palestinian society, in Palestine and in exile. We felt that international law had stopped at the door of Palestine. So we took matters into our own hands and we walked the South African path, if you will. We were inspired by their anti-apartheid movement, the anti-colonial movement in India, the U.S. civil rights movement, and of course, our own struggle. But our key inspiration comes from the decades-old rich Palestinian heritage of popular nonviolent resistance to settler colonialism. BDS is a collective Palestinian voice, an absolute majority, asking democratic citizens worldwide to join us in pressuring city councils, churches, trade unions, companies, and ultimately governments to stop its links of complicity with Israel. The cultural boycott is a very important part because cultural institutions play a key role in whitewashing, or what we call art washing, of Israeli apartheid and occupation. It calls for something much more profound than help. Do no harm. If an international artist comes to Tel Aviv, they are lending their name to a system of apartheid and oppression. That is not art for the sake of art, music for the sake of music. That is complicity. The cultural boycott targets complicity, not identity, urging the cancellation of events, activities, agreements, or projects involving the Israeli state, its lobby groups, or its cultural institutions, to reject funding and sponsorship from the Israeli government. No one is calling for suppressing the rights of Israeli artists. If the UK invites an Israeli filmmaker to show her film with no institutional connection to the state of Israel, the embassy or lobby groups, there is absolutely nothing in the boycott to prevent this. Actually, BDS explicitly calls on Israelis to join us. Israelis who abandoned colonial ideology, policies, and dehumanization, who recognize our three basic rights under international law. Ending the occupation, ending apartheid, and the right of return for refugees. Since there is nothing Jewish about occupation, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, the siege of Gaza, and all the crimes committed, then there is nothing inherently anti-Jewish in proposing that this is against humanity and campaigning to end it. Of course, there is anti-Semitism that really bugs our minds, and it is growing every day in the West. BDS was very clear from the beginning that we oppose all forms of racism, including anti-Semitism. In fact, we don't see Palestine ever being liberated without an international movement for justice and equality 
winning the war for racial, indigenous, gender, economic, and environmental justice, making this world better for everyone. In Ferguson, USA, after the first uprising when Michael Brown was killed, the Palestinians were one of the first to apply solidarity because we understand oppression. Since 2014, Israel started to consider BDS a strategic threat. It is a fact that they have invested hundreds of millions of dollars to fight it, so they clearly do see the impact. It is extremely impressive how much the movement has grown in numbers. They have started to target me personally, taking steps toward revoking my residency or pressing me with travel bans. The worst was when my late mother was undergoing surgery for cancer in Jordan. I wasn't allowed to leave to be with her. Yes, I am worried for my life. And they use tools that don't exactly show who the culprit is. At a public conference in front of 200 people and the world's cameras, the Israeli Minister of Intelligence threatened me with civil assassination. I had never heard this term before. Possibly it means an assassination at the hands of civilians. So it hurts on a personal level tremendously. But that is part of the price that all Palestinians pay, part of our resistance. They are telling us you can't boycott Israel. So what do you want us to do? You don't want us to do armed resistance and you don't like our non-violent resistance. What do you want us to do? We shall never give up. A Place to Fly. Renine Alade, Youth and Child Coordinator of the Freedom Theater, Janine Refugee Camp. November 2022, the boy with the golden heart is gone. It was the first shock, Mahmoud just 17 years old, the first child from the Freedom Theater to be killed. He was returning from school when the army entered Janine. Children started throwing stones, so he joined them. Immediately, the sniper took his life. When I found out, I collapsed. The news of his martyrdom hurt my body and brought me to tears. Mahmoud, you were very dear to me. I knew your face as a child, soft without a beard. Even as you grew up trying to show in every way that you were a man, a man with a big heart and a child full of kindness. I think of you coming to the stage and joining the workshops to have fun and play. I know you loved to be at the theater, even as you carried a cigarette and pretended not to care. Naughty, causing chaos, your heart was big enough to embrace the whole camp, its streets and its homes. That is what hurts the most. The boy with a golden heart is gone. May God be with you, Mahmoud. I thank you for passing through my life and being my student. November, 2022, breaking the barrier of fear. Without warning, Mustafa Shita, the producer at the Freedom Theater, informed me that the Israeli army had entered Janine camp. I was in a workshop with the children and I fell into thoughts of how I would manage with them whilst hearing the voices of people screaming in the streets. At the theater, we teach kids all the artistic skills so they can better express themselves, so they understand their human rights and cultural rights. We believe that young people can impact the way the whole society thinks. That day in the workshop, as the situation worsened with sounds of explosions, shots, and clashes, I decided to inform the children that we must help each other feel safe. Together, we broke the barrier of fear and worry to defy all circumstances, even as the electricity cut off and plunged us into darkness. June 2023 between our first and second martyrs. A few months ago, we lost our baby Mahmoud, and today we lost Sadil. She was 15 years old, shot in the head by a sniper in the courtyard of her home. Maybe they targeted her because she was documenting what was happening, maybe. Between our first and second martyrs, six months and 19 days, between our first and second martyrs, 
pain is renewed, loss repeated, and my memory bursts with features of your face. In the corners of the theater, you are still there. Every time I step on the stage, I remember you. How you laughed and played in the stage would carry your dreams and imagination. You were always present with me in training, always ready for mischief, making others determined by your smile and kind features. Between our first and second martyrs, my eyes saw the funeral of Sadil turn into deafness, unable to speak or express. The eyes of family and school friends filled with anger and sadness, their voices with the screams from the pain of your loss. Which of our children is next? We are all targeted by the sniper. May God have mercy on our martyrs, our loved ones, our children. July, 2023, joy and happiness. During the invasion, the theater was bombed. We were all afraid. After three days, the army withdrew and we learned the building was not directly hit, but the courtyard outside was destroyed. The courtyard, where all the neighborhood kids gather. A space where they laugh and play without anyone telling them shh. Despite the theater being targeted, the children insist on returning. Families contact me and ask, what are you doing? Why do they always want to come to the theater? It is simple. Here there is joy and happiness without conditions. The invasions affect them very much, and they can't convey their emotions at home. So despite the risks, they return to the theater because it is a beautiful space that embraces their dreams and creativity an oasis away from the disasters they are exposed to, a place where they express their feelings, speak about their cause, and laugh as they find themselves. August 2023, Creating in the Darkness. We were meant to do training outside today, but we decided to stay indoors because the Israelis might invade the camp at any moment. We try to continue creating in the dark atmosphere under the heat of gunfire. We try to plant hope in the hearts of the children. Yet they live in constant tension as they face ongoing threats to their lives. We always feel this danger. It's the current situation of the theater, the whole camp, the whole country. September 2023, warning sounds of sirens. At 10.30 in the morning, everything was good. People were at work and students in school. I was at my front door about to leave for the theater when the warning sounds of sirens began. Bulldozers and jeeps passed as people went crazy trying to escape to their homes or find a safe place. Mustafa called me. The occupation army is everywhere. They've surrounded the theater. I'm with Isra and we can't leave. And then he says, I'm hungry. <laughs> we both laugh. For hours, Mustafa and Isra were held captive in the theater, like hundreds of other people stuck in their workplace and thousands of children trapped inside schools. After this, we decided we must move to the rehearsal space in the city. It'd become too dangerous to be inside the camp. How can we deliver the rights of children? Every day they are arrested and killed and all people are silent. November, 2023. I think they are targeting me. They entered my house. They destroyed everything. They put us in one room, even the children, telling us to be silent. I think they are targeting me because of what I do in the theater. It's a long street and there are many houses, so why did they come specifically to my home? I feel anxious. I feel they will take me one day. November 2023, Destiny. The most challenging experience is to realize that Yamin, who was once right there with you in the theater, playing, laughing, and quarreling, is now a martyr. I was shocked when I heard that he had joined the Janine Brigade. He was 16 years old. 
I contacted his family because I needed to know his story. I discovered he simply didn't want to live anymore. He wrote a letter by hand asking everyone for forgiveness, that he was sorry. These emotions are just too big for a kid. Too many children in Palestine want to end their lives. That is why he joined the resistance. It is a certain death. At the theater, we are trying to change their minds so they understand other choices besides martyrdom. We think with them about where they want to be in the future, how they can determine their destiny, that there are different ways to resist, not just with a gun. But inside me, I have bad feelings. I feel annoyed. I become everything in their lives. I am the mother, the sister, the mentor, and the teacher. I'm also facing all these invasions as I'm trying to help young people. The situation is very difficult, and all these pressures keep coming on me. I've reached a point where I don't want to hear anyone's story. I'm exhausted. December 2023, Dangerous Ideas. One piece of news can flip all scales. And you remember you were in danger of being arrested for just an idea. Workshop, workshops with children, culture, and art. This morning, the Israeli army broke into Mustafa's house and put his family in one room, tied him up and took him in a jeep. Mustafa Sheta, the producer of the Freedom Theater, put in the pocket of the Israeli army. At the theater, the soldiers smashed everything. They arrested Tobasi, the artistic director, and later Jamal, one of the acting students. May Allah release you all as soon as possible. December 2023, the heavy burden of absence. Today is Saturday. I'm supposed to meet Mustafa about work with the children. Today was supposed to be laughter. You telling us a climate change joke and discussions about our daily lives. Today, we were supposed to switch from our reality and talk about future workshops and what we will do for Eid. I am asking tomorrow, how will we operate normally without you? Your absence is a heavy burden. May God return you to the corners of the stage as soon as possible. January 2024. Seats. These children in the Freedom Theater are an army. Despite everything happening, the invasions, the destruction of the theater, and Mustafa still imprisoned, the children keep coming back. Two days ago, the Israelis invaded in the evening and didn't leave till seven in the morning. By eight, the kids were gathered at the theater wanting to go on a trip to the park. I wish with all my heart to give them everything. If I get killed or something bad happens, I want everyone to take care of these children. They are more important than anything else. They are the seeds and will grow up to give their fruits, to give everything positive implanted in them to society. Don't be afraid. This generation will be leaders in all circumstances and challenges. Mustafa Sheta has been given six months of administrative detention. Imprisonment without charge or trial. This can be renewed indefinitely. The story of the Freedom Theater, Janine Refugee Kim. Giuliano Mirfamis, co-founder and artistic director of the Freedom Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our production of Alice Wonderland. I dream that the Freedom Theater will be a major force in generating cultural resistance, creating a political and artistic movement that raises its voice against discrimination. Hope lives on in Janine. Perhaps it was precisely my mother, Arna's death, that brought it to life. Sometimes the dead are more powerful than the living. There is a feeling that the spirit here is already seated. 
And it's going to only grow. And I don't believe that anyone can stop. The third intifada must be a cultural. Ahmed Tabasi, current artistic director, the Freedom Theater. On the 4th of April, 2011, Juliano Mer Hamis was murdered, shot five times by an unknown masked man just steps away from the Freedom Theater. He left behind his infant son, two daughters, and wife, who was pregnant with twins. Giuliano had recently directed his students in a production of Alice in Wonderland. I didn't realize that our lives would still be in danger, even as artists. An open mind is a dangerous mind, and culture has made us dangerous. Giuliano taught us how to use art to fight for change, how the stage could be as powerful as an AK-47, how culture was a form of resistance. We learned how using art, we could question the world, how we could face our life, ourselves, our community, challenge our oppressors, and confront all the difficulties of humanity. Giuliano died teaching us this. Now, we must pass it on to the next generation. Thank you all so much. I want to invite everybody else to come back on camera just so we can thank this incredible group of performers. Thank you so much for, for being a part of this, for sharing this important text and these testimonies uh, with, with us and with everyone. Um, folks who might want to learn more about the revolution's promise, uh, please go to uh, the Freedom Theater's website. There's also, they have a website, theculturalintifada.com, where you can learn more and read the whole text in many different languages. Do it in your communities. Um, please, please, please spread these stories. Um, just give one more just moment of gratitude to all of these beautiful artists you see on the screen here. Thank you so much. Now um, we'll begin to transition into the next session, um, which is going to be called Creating Free Palestine Through Song, Dance, and Stories from the Diaspora. Uh, it'll be exploring the work of artists including Electra Debki Band, 47 Soul, musical theater writer Fouad Dakwar, songwriter Naima Shaloub, and more. Um, and I'm joined here by my wonderful co-moderator, uh, JJ Alfar. Welcome, JJ. 